welcome to the Kirby Info in 2018. I got the glory of uh, basically opening it this time around um, with a really, really amazing topic, one of the many speculation attacks we have this year. Um, this is the latest one of the bunch, uh, L1TF, which is the one that probably affects us the most of uh, every one of them. Um, but before I get started, uh, who am I, who has not seen me? Um, I'm Alex Graf, I'm a KVM community developer officially for SUSE. It doesn't mean I do a lot of KVM community work <coughs> these days because I got involved in the ARM group a while back and uh, I'm basically dedicating most of my time now to ARM things, um, which also got me into U-Boot and UEFI things. So if you want to see other amazing, fun hacks that I do, um, look at my other talks from other conferences. Uh, I usually do things that seem weird and hard. Um, L1TF is nothing that I actually did, it's what Intel did. Uh, so this, this one is not to blame on me. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what this all, whole thing is about, uh, how it works, how potentially you could make use of it on either side of white and black. Uh, and ideas on how to mitigate it, how we mitigate it today, how we could potentially mitigate it tomorrow, just things that are floating around uh, at this point in time. But to understand what this whole thing is about, um, we need to understand what uh, speculation is. So who of you knows what CPU speculation really does? Okay, so, so I, I, need to, I need to actually go in, in, into a bit of detail there. So this is a simple C snippet, just a simple C function um, that takes a pointer uh, and then adds a number to a global variable and then returns an addition of that number and uh, the dereference of that pointer. This is a completely contrived example. I just wanted to have some code that would potentially speculate in your CPU. <clears throat> so in reality, when your CPU executes this, it doesn't execute C code. It executes assembly or, well, actually opcodes. Real these these number strings here, these number sequences um, that are human readable, as you can see, they're really readable uh, on the right hand side. And this is the the thing your CPU actually goes and, and uh, makes use of to execute whatever you wanted to execute. So in this case, what uh, this code does is it basically goes and uh, adds the one value we added, we, had, uh, we put in as a parameter to the function uh, to a global variable, which is in memory. Uh, then it copies uh, the other, uh, the, the, the value, the result of that into <coughs> another register, which is the return register, and adds the, uh, another point ID reference uh, to our data structure that we passed into the C function uh, to that one again in return. It's, Really just a couple of instructions to show the example of what speculation does, because in reality, your CPU doesn't execute those instructions one after another. This, it does give you a fake assumption it would, but in reality, doing that first instruction is going to take a while, because <clears throat> this thing over here, this global variable, is in memory, and memory is not always fast to access. It depends on how fast, on a couple of constraints on how fast it is, to, it is to access. I will get to that in a couple of later slides, but Basically, uh, this instruction might take, it might take up to 300 cycles, depending on how, you, how things go at this point, even more. So during that time, you have a lot of spare time on your hands, so what does, do you do as a CPU? Well, you may as well go and speculate beyond that instruction and do other things. Um, I just realized this is a terrible example because that instruction couldn't actually get executed because it needs the result. But, <laughs> you're getting the idea, the CPU basically goes on and executes stuff and uh, does all of that in the background uh, while it, is, it, it basically shows you the, a world that lives here, but in reality it already has something like a sibling virtual CPU that executes all these pieces over here, uh, one after another, uh, even though we are still stuck at this instruction. And the idea is that <coughs> any of these things down here, if we're accessing memory, for example, um, we can pull that into faster access paths than what we would have if we didn't execute the pieces in between. That's roughly the idea. That's, that's more to it, but just so you, it's, it's all about being fast in memory access. That, that is the ultimate goal. Sometimes you can actually use the results you calculate using speculation, even in, in your green arrow, right? Um, but if we look at what this, uh, this, this pointer really is, um, it, that's the global variable that we're accessing, this memory we're accessing. That one goes and uh, uh, dereferences or refers to a location in memory. And memory these days is incredibly slow. Um, and if I'm saying incredibly slow, I mean 
on, on a Skylake system down here, you find a website where you can figure out all the uh, amazing latency numbers that it needs to, to access memory on different CPU architectures and types. Uh, it takes about 250 CPU cycles, depending on how fast your CPU runs, how fast your RAM runs, but give or take 250 cycles to access just memory. And I mean, if you imagine that you wouldn't have anything in between your CPU and that memory, um, and every time you access memory, it would take 250 CPU cycles, you basically can tell that <coughs> you would be crawling, right? So it's, accessing memory directly is completely out of the question. You cannot do that. So people invented caches. Um, there are a couple of levels of caches. Uh, we, for example, have the level 3 cache, which on that system that I have as an example is about 8 megabytes. Um, so it's a much, much smaller amount of memory than your whole memory, but it is way faster. It only takes 40 cycles to access. Uh, well, it's still not as fast as you want it to be, so there's more levels. There's a level 2 cache, which is even again smaller. So it's only a quarter uh, megabyte big. But it is faster, it only takes 12 cycles to access, and then we have the ultimate fast access, which is our level one data cache, um, and that one only takes four cycles to access on that particular CPU that I uh, have an example, as an example, it's just startling. But uh, another thing that this diagram doesn't show is there's actually a good reason for this hierarchy, um, and that's that all of these caches sit at different pieces in your topology. So you have level one caches per core, usually you have level two caches per core complex, and then you have level three caches per cluster, or even maybe per, per full system or per SOC. Uh, and your RAM is depending on how numerous you are, also either only a single big entity or multiple different pieces. Uh, this could be its own presentation, so don't fault me if you don't get the full picture, but this is the rough idea is you have the faster you get, uh, the smaller the caches, and the more you need caches. So another thing we have in uh, modern machines is called paging. Uh, I guess for almost all of you know what paging is, but I'll just quickly uh, get through that. And that's that the address we looked at, which is a memory reference to memory, uh, the reference to memory, is not actually referring memory directly. It is there's another level of indirection. Um, because you can always add another, uh, which is uh, basically we have a virtual, a virtual address space uh, which our applications use. So if you're running an application, you have basically this really, really big address space that sparsely in between has some pieces that then get mapped over into <coughs> your actual physical memory down here using a page table entry. It's a data structure that's controlled by your operating system and that allows you to basically give you a virtual view of the world as an application, but still maintain a contiguous memory model uh, down as, uh, at, at the actual physical layer. <clears throat> These page table entries are pretty simple. They just basically show, based, based on the, uh, on, it's, it's a table, it's actually a, a hierarchy of tables, and based on the, at the point that you're getting to the page table entry, you do know which virtual address you're already referring to, which is the one up here. So all you need to write into your, physical, into your page table entry is the physical address, so the one down here you want to refer to, and a couple of flags. Write through um, whether you want to actually use caches or not uh, for writes. Um, user access, can user access that? Is it a kernel-only uh, page table? If you've seen Meltdown, that's the one they exploit. Uh, write, can you write to that page? Can you, is it read-only? Do you want to get a page for it when you write to it? Uh, and the present bit. It's the last one. Uh, if you, for, for L1TF, the important bit is the present bit. So what happens if you don't set the present bit? Usually, um, in a normal system, and that still is the case, don't worry, uh, Intel didn't mess up that much, uh, you are getting a page fault. Page fault means your execution stops, and at that point you're going and uh, recover, your, you're going to a recovery function basically in your operating system to recover from whatever fault they happen. You can use page faults for a lot of things. We use page faults in Linux, for example, for copy and write. So page faults are used all over the place. It's, it's, a, it's a completely normal mechanism that everybody is using page faults all day long. So with this virtual model, how does that fit in with our caches? So we have this level one cache, and in that level one cache, we have data for a couple of things we call cache lines, which just small pieces of, uh, of data. And then how do, we, how do we actually associate our memory 
or how do we how do we know which address the cache actually refers to in our overall system? If we used virtual tags, um, that gets us into into really big trouble, because if we are only virtually tagged over here, um, then every time we have the same page down here mapped into two different processes, we would have to make sure we keep those coherent on the same cache hierarchy. So that's why people usually on Intel always do physically tagged caches, which means you're putting this pointer here, the, the address to, to this physical address, in your level one cache. And associate a couple of bytes with it, basically, 64 bytes on Intel. In a virtual <laughs> machine environment, we usually don't only have a single page table through because we have a virtual machine. So we have the same mechanism again for translation from host page to, or from host memory to guest memory, and then from guest memory to guest application memory. So this is a host physical address, a guest physical address, and a guest virtual address. So we have two levels of page tables. Which one would you put into your cache? Well, the obvious answer is you, of course, always put the one that's closest to you in. Um, so we can. In a virtual machine, we put this address in. In a physical environment, we put this address in, because then you can speculate faster. You don't have to go through two, two, through two levels of page table just to be able to speculate. Right? It's just quicker. <clears throat> so what is all this L1TF thing about then? Let's go to, through a simple example of um, what secrets we could have. So imagine we have a CPU, and the CPU runs <laughs> some secret code, something that holds a secret like your SSH session, like anything. <coughs> and obviously because it accesses that secret, that secret is now in your level one cache. Because you just accessed it, so you want to have it accessed fast again, probably, so it's always stored in your level one cache. Now if somebody evil comes in and runs in a virtual machine, so you get a context switch, other person comes in, runs, that data chunk is still in level one cache. <laughs> and that person could potentially, this is taken from official Microsoft documentation, um, so you can just look that up. Um, it could, he could potentially uh, read some variable down here and then access an oracle, just a, a global variable again, um, based with an offset based on that uh, variable he read. <laughs> which usually, well, translates to uh, assembly code, and then usually in a normal environment, imagine you have your page table all properly set up, everything is valid, you have the present bit set, everything does exist. Uh, that would mean that you're reading from this address, that address points to this pointer down here, which happens to have the same address as a physical address as that pointer, because there's another tag that says I'm in this virtual machine, it doesn't really affect it. And then it will go in and basically load yet another piece of data from my virtual memory into the level, the level, the, into the level one cache, and then you can just access that one uh, using your instructions. But that's something what we want to do if we want to exploit level one terminal for, right? So the idea behind that is what if we don't actually expose a real page table entry that says there's a mapped entry, but instead expose something that's invalid, like a non-present entry? Well, if it's non-present, that means you're getting a page fault, right? Non-present <coughs> means we, this, this page doesn't exist, CPU, please go and hold everything you do, and instead allow me to handle that page fault in a defined manner. Well, it turns out page, taking a page for it actually takes quite a while. And what do you do when something takes a while? You speculate. So because the page for takes so long, we can now go and actually make use of the address that we put into our page table entry as a speculation address, because obviously the non-present entry had a valid entry in its page table in its physical address uh, piece. And then we suddenly have, in speculative context, our secret in a register, in a speculative register, so we don't actually get to see it, but we have something we can work with. So if we take that, we shift it over a bit, um, and then we uh, access another variable based on the secret value, 
That again means we're pulling in data into the cache. So now we have another piece of data that we know where it is and what it is in the cache that is actually accessible by us as a per evil person. We're well, not evil, of course. But. So now we're getting the page fault handler. And in the page fault handler, all we need to do is we need to go and measure how long it takes to access really slow memory over really fast memory because that one piece is now in our level one cache. And suddenly we basically have about eight bits of data from our secret, depending on how we big we, we do the chunks in our uh, Oracle, but in this example it's eight bits. So we, uh, eight bits, yes, so one byte. So we now have one byte of data that is actually secret that we shouldn't even have potentially access, have access to. Now this gets even better. Um, there's another cool feature in Intel CPUs called hyperthreading. So imagine you have a CPU, and the CPU has a lot of different components. It has like different, an ALU, actually a lot of different ALUs that can do things in parallel, and then you have load units and store units and AVX units and whatever. All of these units, and most of them are idle because you, even with speculation, you cannot really fill all the pieces up all the time. So Intel figured, well, if we expose another CPU that is not actually another CPU, but really just another view onto the same CPU that can execute a different instruction stream, we can maybe fill up those instruction units um, a bit, or those, those, those computation units a bit better. And that's what hyperthreading is. So hyperthreading basically shares almost all resources, but it gets, from an operating system point of view, looks like a separate CPU. Because of that, it obviously also shares your level one cache, which means if you now have your secret application running on this one thread, and your evil application running on the other thread, you put your secret data into your shared level one cache, and immediately that other person gets to see it. You don't even need a context switch. There's no chance an operating system can do anything about any of what's, said, what's, what's in here because it doesn't even get involved. <clears throat> Which means, how do we mitigate all of this, right? How do, we, how do we fix up the situation that makes people secure again? Well, if we're running on the same core, uh, same, same thread, basically, if we, if we only we imagine a world where we don't have hyper threading, it's only a single core, we need to have a context switch to go between our secret process and our untrusted process. And because inherently this bug can only really be well exploited um, by using a virtual machine, because only then you have control over your page tables, which you need. In reality, we have KVM in between, right? So we usually have KVM coming in between our trusted environment and our untrusted environment. Which means KVM can easily just go and flush the cache and be good. Because at that point, there's nothing left in the cache for this guy to see, and then he can do whatever he wants it wouldn't actually affect anything. Well, unfortunately, that's not as easy as it sounds because there's hyperthreading. <coughs> so what do you do about hyperthreading? Turn it off, exactly. You just turn it off because why would you need CPU features, right? <laughs> um, that is the current recommendation. So basically, if, you, if you're running any recent kernel these days, it turns off hyperthreading for you, or you, it at least tells you to turn off hyperthreading, and then there's a kernel command line parameter that allows you to automatically turn off, turn off hyperthreading if you're running virtual machines. Because otherwise, you will be insecure. Uh, and it flushes the level one cache on VM entry and exit, depending on a couple of heuristics. So what does that mean performance-wise? So performance-wise, um, the easy thing people usually do when they measure performance is build kernels, because that's what we do all day. Uh, and I couldn't find a better example at this point. <clears throat> so if you disable hyperthreading, you basically get, well, so this, this is an example where you see uh, this is running with only, I had an eight core system, 16 threads. This is when I only use uh, eight cores. This is when I use all 16 threads. Uh, the performance difference in the kernel build really is 50 to 20 percent. It's not that much. Um, you, you are losing a bit of performance, but then again, you gain security, which is good. You want to gain security. 
uh, I heard of examples, and I definitely am pretty sure if I actually spend another week on this, I could probably contrive an example where you get this number down to 50%. But that would be a something that usually would not happen in the real world. Right? It's, it's, uh, it would be a very contrived example. So this is a, something actually you would see. So imagine, or oh, imagine, assume you will definitely get a slowdown of about 20% if you turn off hyper -trading. For the L1D cash flushes, uh, I would say it's almost negligible. Um, I heard of people that also claimed they found on certain CPUs with certain workloads they were able to get this number again to 50%. So in the worst case, you're basically down to 25% by enabling all mitigations. Uh, in a real world example, it assumed 20 to 30% maybe. But then again, you know, it depends on your workload. If you happen to run, I don't know, memcached, maybe that's a completely different story. Right? Maybe that one actually goes down 50%. So you, want, you, you definitely, after the mitigations, you want to, if you had something fine-tuned before you enabled mitigations and now you enabled them, you definitely want to re-measure things again just to make sure um, the environment is still as good as you thought it would be. <clears throat> so what can we do about this? Now that we know that we can potentially have terrible numbers in performance, um, that actually opens up a lot of performance gap that we can fill with other alternative ideas to waste that time in more innovative ways. Um, so, you saw this picture, right? This is basically the hyper example where uh, you're getting one CPU producing a, a secret and the other CPU consuming the secret, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, why is there nothing we can do about it? I mean, there, there is an event, right? We, we have to have a page fault over here to actually provoke a speculation. Without that page fault, we do not get the speculation. So. Why don't we just go and basically, well, we're getting this page fault to get our data. We have to run our evil code before and after. And if in between, we just go and clean all of that up in KVM. So in KVM, we just check on page faults, we would be safe, right? The first thing that, that definitely implies overhead. Every page fault would be slower, so you would slow down your normal operation. But then again, if we're talking about 20, 30% slowdown at least, maybe that might be worth it, right? Could be. But there's another caveat to it, and that's another really cool feature in Telex called TSX. Um, transaction memory. So using transaction memory, you can uh, basically have a good number of operations behave as if they really only ever occurred at, as a single entity. So you have 10, ten instructions, and these 10 instructions either all complete at the same time, or they just never complete. And conveniently enough, that includes page faults. So if in between your transaction you're getting a page fault, it just aborts the transaction. But everything that happened, that everything that happened before that transaction still had an effect on your caches. Add one on one, and you know what I mean. Um, it basically means if you had, if you have transactions, you do not have any event to trap on in KVM. There's no way uh, you can ever know what uh, that that a transaction or that 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 this page fault even occurred. It, it's completely hidden inside the CPU. Uh, so potentially you could say, well, let's just disable transactions. Right? Uh, nobody uses transaction memory anyways. We can we can just not expose that feature in the first place, and then we're, we're safe again, because then we can trap on page faults and we can disable transactional memory. Uh, turns out on modern Intel CPUs, uh, transactional memory is considered a uh, legacy feature, so it's not conditionally switchable anymore. So you can't turn it off. It's always there. The other thing is, in order to actually provoke this page fault, you always have to have a page table entry that has the present bit not set. That's the only way to ever get this page fault. And at the same time, while you have the zero in there, you have to have something sensible in this address to actually read out data from your cache, because that's the tag you're trying to read from.
<clears throat> so what if in that environment, so this is our nested page uh, environment, right? we have our nested page table and then our normal guest page table. Over here, because all of the above is handled by a virtual machine or inside the virtual machine, there's basically nothing we can do about it. We, we can, again, we can trap on the page files, but that doesn't help because of TSX. We can't really tell the guest not to set its own page table because that's the whole point of nested paging. That's why we have it, because we want to be fast. But back in the day, there used to be something we called Shadow PD, um, where we didn't have hardware that actually allowed us to have these two page tables after one after another. And instead, KVM would go and convert guest page tables to host page tables and do sanitization for you. And sanitization obviously means it uh, would never add a present page <coughs> with a real physical address put in. So you're safe. If you're using Shadow PDE, if you just dis dis disable EPT altogether on Intel CPUs, you are safe as well. Unfortunately, um, Shadow PDEs have their downsides. Um, there's two to them. One is uh, if you have one application and then you want to context switch to another application, you need to change your, uh, your CO3 value, your page table value. So you're switching from one page table to another page table. And that is obviously a privileged <coughs> operation because only the kernel can do that. And in that environment, you don't want to actually have the guests set that directly to the CPU unless you're running with nested pages, which again gives you protection. So every time you switch in context, you would have to go to KVM and then go back into your guest to actually do the context switch. Which used to be okay back in the old days, but then Meltdown happened. And thanks to Meltdown, this actually doesn't only occur when you're going between different processes, but on every syscall, multiple times <laughs> on every syscall. So we're taking things from slow <laughs> to crawling, basically. Which wouldn't fit into our 20% performance budget. Um, but there's another really cool feature on Intel VTX, which is called a CO3 whitelist. So you could tell your guest, <coughs> do not set CO3 directly, give me a hyper call if you want to set it, and then you give a canary bag that contains the pointer to your page table that you would put in as a shadow page table. And the guest would just set that as a CO3 value. And in VTX, you would have a list of up to four CO3 values that you allow the CPU to be set regardless of, well, not regardless, that you, that you allow, allow, allow a guest to be set, and if it's not part of those four values, then you get a trap. So that way you would basically be able to get uh, all the meltdown mitigations back to almost zero performance penalty with shadow paging. Now, while we are down to zero performance penalty with shadow paging, it still means a lot of performance penalty because shadow pages are not fast. But why are they not fast? Well, they're not fast because we need to do a lot of work. Um, we need to, every time you modify a page table in the guest, we need to go, get notified, go into KVM and basically create another shadow copy for that page table entry on your host. And that is a slow process. There are a couple of optimizations for that inside of the, uh, in, inside of the shadow paging code, but they're all based on heuristics. You basically go and see, well, if I see so many page faults on the same page table entry, then I just <coughs> set that page table entry to be writable, but next time I get cache flush or uh, TLB flushes, I will just go through that page and loop through every entry afterwards because I assume you probably want to modify the whole page anyways. Well, why don't we take that progress process one more level up? There is a really, really cool feature in modern Intel CPUs called PML, the page modification lock, which really is meant for something completely different. Um, this is what allows us to record what pages a guest touched between the last time we looked at it. So using PML, we can basically get a log of all the pages that a guest was writing to last, since, since, since the last time we processed that page modification log. This is used for live migration. So during live migration, you want to know what got changed in the guest, and everything that got changed, you want to migrate over to the non system. But at the end of the day, changing page tables is the same idea, right? If the, you have a page modification log, you know which pages the guest modifies, so you know exactly which page table, 
pages the guest also modified because you know which page ta which, which which pages inside the guest address space actually are page table tables. So you could use that to combine all of your updates to a point of to, to, to a point where you want, know the guest wants to be coherent again. And on Intel, there are only two of those. There are C of three writes, so basically when you're switching switching context, and there are explicit TLB invalidations. So if on those two you trap and you process your PML log and you just after the fact process through your shadow page tables. You should be much faster. Unfortunately, I wanted to actually prototype this and show you numbers. Um, turns out animations take a lot of time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> as you can see, uh, they really do take a lot of time because I don't have any here. Um, there are other alternatives that people are suggesting these days. So there's uh, call scheduling, where basically you would not allow VMs to be, there are multiple ideas. Um, one idea is you would still see all hyper threads in the host, but if you see a CPU running KVM, it would look for its sibling CPU and make sure that the sibling CPU only ever runs the sibling of the same virtual machine because otherwise you could potentially leak data that is outside of that virtual machine. Um, and then you assume that the virtual machine in itself is secure again because, well, you have a kernel in there that hopefully safeguards your page tables. Uh, turns out scheduling is really hard. Um, I know people who benchmarked this and basically turned, like, point, pointed to, uh, or got, got to points where it was not worth it. Um, it basically also beats up 30% of the performance and then you, you're down to zero. You don't, you don't get any benefit from your hyperthreads anymore. Um, other alternative is we could do what we do on power. Uh, on power, you only expose the first thread ever on your host, and then guests can have more threads. So basically, you schedule all of your sibling threads only when your host thread gets scheduled. So one, a single host CPU basically looks like up to eight guest CPUs at a time. That's that's what we do on power. So we could do the same thing on Intel. Um, people are prototyping all of this currently in the background, so expect patches to uh, either be there or come really soon. Uh, and then this, this helps you against all the hyper-threading problems, but it doesn't help you against the level one cache blockers. And that one reads really easy, but uh, I, the idea is what if you simply don't have anything to hide? Um, and that is a very attractive idea. Uh, I don't know how easy it is. <coughs> I know that uh, a couple of our hyperscaling friends do that. So there are bare metal hypervisors, or not, not bare metal, but more like type one hypervisors. Is it type one? The, one? the ones where you basically have a real split between hypervisor and operating system. Um, that basically makes sure there's nothing that really is terribly secret in your level one data cache when you are going into a virtual machine. So you, could do things on the host, on the side, and then go back in. It's really, really hard in KVM, though, because what happens if you take an interrupt in between your guest execution? Your guest comes in, you process something that really shouldn't affect it too much, or shouldn't, shouldn't actually load any important data into your level one cache, and then you get an interrupt in between, and that interrupt reads data from the network, and you really don't want to have all your network data exposed to your guest, right? It's, it's a very, very hard problem to solve uh, in, in the KVM world. But Alex, that wouldn't help with L1TF anyway, would it? Because you still have, they, they can, with, L, with L1TF you can spy directly on the Wait a second, how about, how about oh, you get this microphone? <laughs> and then everybody can hear it. Okay, well with, isn't it the case that with L1TF, the guests can spy directly on each other using physical addresses, so that wouldn't help L1TF? Particularly, anyway, is that true? Um, it, it would help with other things like <laughs> SP1 or something. Again, if you're looking at the hyperscale idea, you really only run a single guest on one core. Or, well, per, you you have pretty static, pretty static scheduling of, of uh, guests to cores, and then you. Okay. That, that that whole problem simply doesn't exist. So I guess most of you want to see how this works, and um, I'll have to really quickly see if I can actually go and SSH into my test machine to show you that because it doesn't really work well on a Mac. Uh, there we go. This looks really good. 
So this is a really, really simple program. I can probably not read that. Um, this is a really simple program that just goes in and reads something from its cache. It, it, I will show you the code now, but it really is boring. Um, it's just a busy loop at this point that goes and reads secrets from memory that it owns itself. You can see this runs on the host as root. So this is a root process running on the host. This could as well be your GPG application, your SSH application, anything that's running on the host as something that is really, really privileged. Um, and then what we can do is we can go and search our physical address space using a virtual machine. This is a, I'm running a virtual machine with KVM, and it will KVM down here, uh, with a simple L1TF uh, reproducer using a TSX so nobody can ever see what I'm actually doing. <clears throat> and that just goes and searches through my address space. And let's see if that actually works. The demo bus are always faithful. Um, so that found all stale data at address zero. Um, this actually looks like proper data. Um, I guess it did find something. But by the time I'm trying to read it out really hard, that data disappeared. L1 cache is not as big, so you, you get a lot of volatility in there. So it will probably show you lots of zeros now. Yes, there you go. Um, so it didn't actually find that data. Um, then I've, it found some data over here at that address. Um, I'm not quite sure what that is, but that is valid data. So it's trying to read that out too. Up here you can see the physical address that uh, the producer is on. So uh, as soon as you see that pop up, it should be about now after this, um, it will try to read the data that this background task was reading. This is, yes, that's the address. So it actually found data at that address, and there you go. It's the secret. <laughs> I guess with a bit of optimization, you could probably get this down to two seconds or so. You see the point. With that, any questions? Thank you. Hi. So, what I think that is still missing here is that if there is some VM exit path on KVM that does have a half spectral gadget, which means that it does speculatively load from some global variable based on a VM controlled index, then still it basically can read anything on the virtual other space where the KVM VM exit handle runs. And when this is being populated into the layer one D cache, you can still steal it from the cycling hyperfed. So I think that one thing that we need to consider is doing something similar to what Hyper-V has done in Azure, which is basically a isolating the address space where KVM VM exit handles run. And this is something that we need, because it's very big work, then we need to think and collaborate on this. And this wasn't specified here as one of the mitigations. Uh, I, I agree, this was not covered um, at all. I don't know, I mean, it, it depends on how early you can actually do your, your level one cache flush. Um, if you do that before you're getting into any potential gadgets, you don't need that. The problem is that you need to scan for every uh, possible gadget that can be speculatively run with a VM-controlled uh, gadget. So there are some people that work on writing compiler uh, extensions that will find these gadgets. But basically, if you will look at the mailing list, for example, with Linux, you'll see that it's very against <coughs> it. And I, by, I, by the way, think the same. Because yeah. it's, not, it's not a real solution to really put uh, an elephant, for example, or things like that, before every possible branch of OAF. At this point where we are, the only sane mitigation you have is to disable hyperthreads. Yeah, I know. And so I think... Are able to re-enable them in the future? We'll see. Yeah, but I think that we should think about uh, refactoring KVM code to, uh, to isolate the other space of where the VM exit handlers are run. Until at some point, where, where we, for example, flag the, the f that we will flush the layer 1D cache on the next entry to the guest, this is the point where we need to switch the address space to another address space. But until then, we need to run with an isolated address space. Not only the KVM, KVM code will run, similar to what uh, KPTI does for the user space application. Right, and you do know about the performance implication of KPTI, right? Yeah. But so it's, it's much, 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 much faster to just disable hyperthreads in your system. 
I because you would you would basically tr double the time it would take for having the access. No, I don't think so. If you use PCI, I think I think it will still perform much better. So even with PCI-D, you should at least get a like ten to twenty percent performance down, and that eats up every benefit you get from hyperthreads. Yep, like. I see it as a KVM is basically because you run an untrusted application. It's not very different than running an untrusted user space application. Yes. The guest and the user space <coughs> application can be considered very similar. Yes. So this is why I think we should we should pursue such a solution. So there's going to be a buff uh, at KVM forum about L1TF alternatives, etc. Let's take it there. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you mentioned that uh, you need a batch fault to trigger speculation for yes. uh, this problem to happen. Yes. But I don't think that's the only way you can trigger speculation. What about just a simple cache miss? You can, you can, you can trigger speculation just perfectly fine mm -hmm. with any other method, but you cannot trigger L1TF using those. <coughs> so speculate, I mean, I, it took me about two weeks of this presentation time, creation time, to figure out that Inside a speculative context, you cannot trigger an L1TF speculation. So if, you, if you're getting a page fault inside of a speculative path, that will not trigger another speculation based on the physical address <coughs> that the invalid page table entry contained. So yes, you can do any speculation attacks you like, but it will not have tags inside your, it would not read tags from your L1 cache, it will only ever read data that was backed by real page tables on your guest, and then you have guest data in your speculation. You don't have post data in speculation. <laughs> um, I think we can have one more, right? How much time do you have? Hello. Quick question. question. On the, uh, you had mentioned that somebody had uh, implemented core scheduling and yes. profiled it. Yes. Uh, well, no, some, somebody, somebody implemented the, so, so core scheduling is on the work right now. Um, that's a completely different, I, 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 I managed to gather two uh, things. There's, there's core scheduling um, where you actually modify the scheduler and then there's the idea that inside KVM you just shoot down something else that runs on a sibling. And that one was definitely uh, measured and is not good. <coughs> Thank you, we are out of time. Thank you, I'll be around. Thank <laughs> you.